Let us join together in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for your word, for your call into, your, to, into our lives, for teachings that uh, instruct us, that make clear to us your ways for us, and, and also for teachings that confuse us and, and cause us to scratch our heads and, and try harder to understand. Be with us as we listen to your word this morning. Invite us in. Raise questions for us. Help us to strive to be as fully open to your spirit as we possibly can be so that you might draw us more deeply into our life with you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The New Testament reading for this morning, I don't think I've ever written one this way, but it seemed easier. Uh, Mark 12, 28 through 13, 2 except verses 35 through 37. I don't think I've ever written except there. I don't know that that's appropriate way to write it, but it seemed clearer. So there's a, a little section in there that uh, is not quite as directly related to the stories going on. And uh, in interest of time, I uh, am, am cutting that out. So, so hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Mark 28 through 13, verse 2. One of the scribes came near to Jesus and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him a question. And now skipping down to verse 38. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. As he came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing and the meditation of his word. And now, O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, our Bible studies here at Covenant just finished a study by Amy Jill Levine on uh, teaching stories of Jesus. I, I love the subtitle of the book the most. The subtitle was The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. That kind of gets your attention. The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. And so she talks about different parables of Jesus and reminds us that parables are not sermon illustrations where the, the person sharing the parable is trying to help you get the one point that they're making. Parables are, instead are stories that, that turn things in a strange direction and leave us asking questions, leave us trying to wonder what was the person teaching here? What was the person saying? And they're, they're often open to multiple interpretations, at which point we have to decide, what is this saying to me today? What is this saying to us today? How do I need to hear this parable? And so I invite you this morning to hear the story about the widow and her two copper coins, Jesus' observation that she had given more than anyone else. Jesus' commendation of her, think about all of that kind of as a parable, as something enigmatic, maybe not as simple as we thought it was. We've heard the story before. Uh, we've taken away from the story that it doesn't matter how much a person gives, it's, it's the heart that they give it with. Uh, she was giving uh, all that she had whereas people who put in much larger sums uh, were giving what they wouldn't miss, what they had that was kind of left over for them. We hear Jesus' commendation of her uh, that out of her poverty, she has put in everything she had, all she had to live on, whereas the others had given of their abundance. Case closed. That's the interpretation. But is it case closed? Is that all there is to that story? Because the story right before it is about Jesus teaching, beware of the scribes. Beware of how they're in it for themselves. Beware of how they devour the houses of widows. I mean, that's pretty specific, right? They devour the houses of of widows. And then in the very next thing, he commends a widow for giving everything she has. Doesn't it kind of sound like she was a sucker? That she's just given everything she had. She's one of the widows who's just had her life devoured by a religious establishment that was in it for itself. Is she to be commended? What's going on here? So Jesus said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. Those first two verses sound a whole lot more like stuff I need to wrestle with in my long robe and getting seats of honor at times and such. And just trust me, I am and I will and I do. But that's for me to work on outside of the sermon. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances, yeah, we're getting back to it, say long prayers. So know that I'm working on that. But why is this woman commended if she's just fallen prey to a religious establishment that devours the houses of widows. It, get wor it gets worse because she's just put her copper coins in the treasury at the temple. Now, we go forward to the story right after she puts those in. As Jesus comes out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what large stones. 
and what large buildings. And, and truly, some of the stones that they used to build the temple were absolutely massive. We today would look at those stones and say, good heavens, how did they get these here? Considering the technology they had at the time, how did they get these stones that were, you know, dozens of tons, gigantic stones, if not more than that, gigantic, gigantic stones. Jesus isn't impressed by the stones. He says not one stone will be left on top of another. Man, in fact, about 40 years after the death of Jesus, the temple was destroyed, completely, utterly destroyed. The wailing wall is the, the one section of wall remaining from that great temple. So now not only is, is the widow giving everything that she has to live on to a religious establishment that devours the houses of widows, that is just preying on her, but she's also giving everything that she has for a temple that's about to be destroyed. And it's not simply that the temple is destroyed. It's that the Sadducees go away. They no longer have a job without a temple. The chief priest gone. That total approach to worship with sacrifices at the temple is wiped off the map of Judaism. What arises, what remains in its place is worship focused around the synagogue where the Pharisees, the scribes, become the, the heirs or the, the, not the heirs, the, the, the forebears to the, the rabbinical tradition. But it's not simply that the temple's destroyed, that entire way of worship, that entire way of expressing faith, it's wiped off the map. She's giving to a losing cause and to a corrupt one that's just devouring houses like hers. So why is Jesus commending her? It's starting to get strange, isn't it? It's starting to get bizarre. I invite you to go back with me to verse 28, that first section, where there's a scribe, the very group that's just been condemned by Jesus, there's a scribe who doesn't end up getting condemned, a scribe who asks Jesus. It doesn't say he's testing Jesus, simply that he asks Jesus, what is the first commandment of all? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He says more but in a nutshell. And the scribe says, you're right. You, you have spoken well. That is correct. And in fact, that's more important than all whole sacrifices and offerings. Than this whole temple tradition. And Jesus says, well, actually, you are right. You are not far from the kingdom of God. And so we have a widow who has given everything that she had to give to a corrupt system that's about to be destroyed. And we have a scribe that's part of the group that's condemned that's just gotten it right about what's the most important thing. And we've got a pastor that's still uncomfortable with the whole long robes and long prayers part, and we'll keep working on that. And we have a congregation that sometimes, sometimes wonders, am I giving to a losing cause? What if I could come back 40 years from now and find out that all of this is gone? then how would I feel about what I've done over the last decade, over the last 60 years? And we have a widow who gave everything she had to live on, and Jesus commended her. And we wonder why. Friends, I, I don't know the answer, but I have my suspicions. 
And one of my suspicions is the affirmation that nothing that is done in love is ever wasted. Nothing that is done in love is ever wasted. There is no love of God that is not expressed as love for people. There is no deep, profound, struggling, striving love of God that doesn't turn into a deep, profound love for God's people, particularly those people who are in greatest need. Psalm 146 that we read this morning speaks about God's care for those who are most vulnerable. There is no love of others. Whether people realize it at the time or not, there is no deep, profound love and care for others. That is not at the same time. Even for an agnostic or an atheist, there is no deep, profound love of God that is not at the same, uh, I mean, love of people that is not at the same time an expression of love for God. As we grow with one side of the jump rope, so to speak, we're twirling the other side as well. As we grow in love for God, we are growing in love for others. If we try to separate those and love God without having to deal with all the jerks out there, it doesn't work. If we try to love people while not believing in God, it, it doesn't work. Not fully, not deeply. But anything that is done in love, a deep, committed, profound love, cannot be wasted. And I think Jesus saw in the woman someone who was giving herself heart and soul, life and death, for the sake of the world around her, for the sake of the God she loved. And nothing that is done in love is ever wasted. We cannot know the future. We have worked hard to build up the campus that we have to restore, to, to revitalize, to, to totally transform much of the campus around us. We plan in the years to come to be good stewards of those gifts and, and to care for the facilities that are around us, but we do not worship them. God was able to do God's purposes in the world without the temple, without the Sadducees, without the chief priests. None of that was necessary in the end for God to do God's purposes in the world. Perhaps this widow who brought forward her two copper coins into the place that was about to be torn down to its foundation uh, was helping to lay a new foundation or at least was symbolic of the new foundation that was being laid down, a foundation of love, deep, committed, passionate, compassionate love, a foundation that cannot be destroyed, a foundation that is never wasted. As we go through our time of stewardship, as we go through our time of learning and growing and struggling as a congregation, may we be a people whose greatest hope, whose, whose greatest sense of the security of our future, as grateful as we are for the buildings around us, we recognize that our future rests on the foundation of love. Love for God, love for one another's. May we build on that and pray that God will build on that so that whatever is here, whatever remains, whatever goes out into the world from us, from the people who spend time within these walls, will be built on that foundation, on that rock, that not even the gates of hell can destroy. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for disciples who were too easily impressed by the wrong things, just as we are, for scribes who were too 
easily impressed by long robes and long prayers, just as I am. For people who read and wonder if the woman was giving to a losing cause, just as some of us, maybe many of us, sometimes wonder ourselves. And we give you thanks for a foundation laid in love, most specifically and powerfully by you, becoming flesh and dwelling among us and giving your life that we may have life and helping us see the power of love in action. And so we pray that you would help us in and through the spaces that you have given us to live in, to lay a new foundation, to nurture the foundation already laid, to be a part of a community that is built on love, love for you and love for others, most particularly those who are most vulnerable. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.